Okay, sorry, no 11.7 for this section. We're actually going to move on to chapter 12, which is um, we're starting to get into some vector calculus. Okay, so chapter 11 was all about just basically giving you the foundation of little bits of information that you're going to need as we keep moving along through the course. Okay, so they talked all about vectors. They meant they started talking about planes. They started talking about three dimensional um, graphs. Um, and then they even talked about how to um, start converting into cylindrical coordinates or how to start converting into spherical coordinates. Now, all of that information is going to be used so that when we start getting to the calculus of this three-dimensional space, um, we can do the conversions that are necessary to make the computation part easier for ourselves, okay? Because we will eventually get into derivatives and we will eventually get into integrals and some integrals and some derivatives, as you know from experience in Cal 1 and Cal 2, sometimes are easier when they look a certain way, okay? And so all of those conversions and all of that is going to definitely help us to know which route we should take in trying to find um, those values. Um, but also when we start talking about um, like the volumes, the um, when we start integrating along the graph with respect to one variable versus another, um, knowing what those three-dimensional spaces look like um, can come in handy as well. So that's also another reason why we had to cover everything that we covered in that chapter 11, okay? But moving forward, we're actually gonna start getting into the calculus stuff, okay? And so we do have to start with the very, very um, beginning. Um, and that's just basically function notation, okay? So when we started in algebra, you started talking about function notation. But now that we're getting into vector valued functions, we're going to be um, going into um, vector function notation for all of these things. So bear with me as we go through this, okay? Okay, so we're going to start working with this. Now, in the past, we had um, regular functions, and now we have vector value functions. So for number one, for instance, it has R and notice it's in bold print because it is a vector and it's written like this, but I'm going to mention, I think I've mentioned it before actually, um, that I specifically do not like the um, unit vector form of uh, vectors period. So normally what I do is I'll change them into their component vector form, okay? So I will change that into the I component goes in the first position, and then the J component, which is a negative T minus seven, goes in the second component. This can be simplified to one half T squared and then negative T plus seven or seven minus T, right? Um, so when they start asking for these parts, R of seven, we're just literally replacing the T with seven. But notice that the result is a vector, not just a value in a regular function, okay? So here I get 49 over two and here I just get zero. So it is a vector. Now for part B, they want me to find the vector value of zero. So that means I would be plugging in zero. And so then I get zero for the first coordinate and seven for the second coordinate. And then C, we're going to plug in S plus seven. So that means one half S plus seven squared and then negative S plus seven plus seven. And so then we get this, I'm just gonna leave it like that. And then here I get negative S minus seven plus seven. And so what I end up with is one half S plus seven squared and then just a negative S, okay? So that one's a little bit trickier. And then for part D, I'm definitely gonna need more space than this little amount here. So I'm gonna go to the next page. But this is still number one, just part D. 
So I'm going to do R of 2 plus delta T minus R of 2. Okay, so that means I'm going to plug in 1 half 2 plus delta T squared and then negative 2 plus delta T plus 7 minus when I plug in 2. So 1 half 2 squared um, comma minus 2 plus 7. So then I get um, 1 half squaring this would give me 4 plus 4 delta T plus delta T squared. And then if I distribute this minus negative 2 negative delta T plus 7. And then that squared, actually this will cancel one of those. So I just get two and then negative two plus seven is five. So if I distribute this one half, I get two plus two delta T plus one half delta T squared and then negative delta T plus five minus two five. So essentially I have this component minus two, which will cancel out the twos leaving me with two delta T plus one half delta T squared. And then here I'll be subtracting five. So positive five minus five will go away and I'll just have negative delta T, okay? And so then this is what you would type in. And you can type them in vector forms, right? All we have to do is remember to use um, vectors and to use this so that we can type them in component form, okay? But let's go ahead and move on to number two. So number two is very similar, but when I write the vector, I'm gonna write it in component form. It's just easier for my eyes that way. Um, it would be cosine of T for the I component and eight sine of T for the J component, okay? So we've got that there. And then um, if I wanna find A, which is R of zero, I'm just typing in cosine of zero, eight sine of zero. Remember these are in radians because there's no degrees given. So cosine of theta and then eight sine of theta. So we get one comma zero. Now for B, we're gonna have R of pi over four. So same thing, cosine of pi over four. 8 sine of pi over 4. Let's see. Um, cosine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. And then 8 sine of pi over 4 gives me 4 square root of 2. Now for part C, 8. Nope, that's not an 8. That's a theta. A theta minus pi. So I get cosine of theta minus pi and then eight sine of theta minus pi. Now, if you type that in, it's gonna count it incorrect because it can be simplified, okay? The not so great thing about it is that you do have to remember your sum and difference formulas for from trig, okay? So I know that this can be written as um, cosine theta, cosine pi plus sine theta sine pi. And then this can be written as eight times sine theta cosine pi minus sine pi cosine theta. And so then um, cosine of pi is I believe negative one. And then sine of pi is zero. Oops, and then this would be zero times cosine theta. So we get negative cosine theta, um, sine of theta times zero is just zero. So this is gone, so is this one, zero times cosine. So all I have here is negative cosine. And here I'll have a negative sine, but times eight. So it'll be negative eight sine theta, okay? So that is all I need to type in for that one. Now for D, I, again, I need more space than this. 
So let me do part D on another sheet of paper. And that is R of pi over six plus delta T. Oops. minus r of pi over six. Now be very careful when you're writing on your paper that if you are talking about a vector, you do need to use your vector notation, okay? I, I promise you, you really need to get the notation down because when we start putting everything together, some of your stuff is gonna be vectors and some of them are gonna be real. And you need to know the difference of which one you're dealing with, whether it's a vector or just a regular function, okay? Um, a scalar function is what they call them. They used to just be called regular functions, just function. Now they're called scalar functions. And these are called vector functions, okay? Now, later on, there's a difference of what you do when you have a scalar function versus what you do when you have a vector function. So you do need to keep that notation so that when you get down at some point in the problem, you know what you're dealing with, okay? Um, and the variables are not going to help you either because you might think to yourself, well, if it's f, then I know it's a scalar function. If it's r, I know it's a vector function. That's not true because some of the some of the scalar functions can also use r. Okay, so you have to be very careful with your notation. Okay, so let's go for it here. I'm going to get um, cosine of pi over six plus delta t, comma, eight sine of pi over six plus delta t. And then I'm gonna subtract cosine of just pi over six and eight sine of pi over six, okay? So let's see what this looks like again, using my sum formulas for um, cosine and sine. So I get cosine of pi over six, cosine of delta t, um, minus sine of pi over six, sine of delta t, comma, and then eight times sine of pi over six, cosine of delta t, plus um, sine of delta t, cosine of pi over six. And then let's go see what cosine of pi over six and sine of pi over six are. So cosine of pi over six. I get square root of three over two and then eight times what? Sine of pi over six. And I get one half. Okay, so that means that these cosines of pi over t are gonna be square root of three over two. And the sine pi over t is going to be one half, or sine of pi over six. And that eight times one half is just four. Okay, let's keep going. So, um, hmm. I don't think I'm gonna be able to simplify this much. So we're just gonna end up with the square root of three over two cosine of delta t minus one half sine of delta t minus the square root of three over two. For the second term, if I distribute this eight, I'm gonna have four cosine of delta t plus four square root of three sine of delta t um, minus four, okay? And you don't need to simplify it any more than that. I mean, there, you could probably convert it into something else equivalent using all your trig identities, but you can just type in this for the first component and this for the second component and it will accept it, okay? Um, number three here. So it gives you these two points and it says represent the line segment from P to Q by a vector valued function. And it says P corresponds to T equal to zero and Q corresponds to T equal to one, okay? So we definitely need to remember um, 
how the vector will work. So basically R of T will become P Q, okay? So then in that case, I'm going to take the Q coordinate minus the P coordinate, the second Q coordinate minus the second P coordinate, and then the third Q coordinate minus the first P coordinate or the third Q P coordinate. And so then I just end up with the vector four, two, four, okay? So um, now it says on the next part, so I do know what to type in for the function, but it says for the next part, it says represent the line segment from P to Q by a set of parametric equations, okay? So then remember these, this is like um, your A, your B and your C, and P is the initial point. Okay, so if P is the initial point, um, that means that X equals this coordinate plus A T, Y equals the Y coordinate plus B T, and Z equals the Z coordinate plus C T. So really you just end up with the equations X equal to 40, y equal to 2t and z equal to 4t. And so this is what they want for that second box, okay? Now number four, let's see. Um, same thing, it's just the p and q are different, right? So for the vector, we're still doing pq. So I'm gonna take the q coordinate minus the p coordinate the next Q coordinate minus the P coordinate, the next Q coordinate minus the P coordinate. And so I end up with plus, so that gives me seven, plus that gives me negative six, and plus that gives me negative five. Again, this goes in the first box, and this is your A, B, and C. So P is the initial point, which actually equals negative eight, negative one, negative three. So that means according to our parametric equations, we're gonna have um, X equal to negative eight plus 70, Y equal to negative one minus 60, because it's negative six, and Z equal to negative three minus five T. And this is what they want in that second box. Okay, number five. Number five, number five. Um, R of T equals I'm gonna put this in component form, okay? Especially since it's in three dimensions now, it starts to get really, really long, okay? So I definitely like to put it in component form. So 7t minus eight for the i component, one third t cubed for the j component, and then just a three for the k component, okay? And then it has another vector function, and this one has t squared for the i component, negative six for the j component, and t cubed for the k component. And so what they want me to compute is r dot with u. So that means first components get multiplied, second components, and so forth. So that means seven t minus eight times t squared plus one third t cubed times negative six, plus three times t cubed. And so then we get seven t cubed minus eight t squared plus, or actually negative, negative two t cubed plus three t cubed, which ultimately gives me eight t cubed minus eight t squared. And that is not a vector. That is a um, scalar valued function. So I would type the 8t cubed minus 8t squared there, but you want to say no, the dot product is always a scalar. So even when you dot product to vector functions, you just end up with the scalar function. Okay. 
Remember, anytime you dot product, it turns the vectors into a scalar, okay? Now we have R of T equal to three cosine T, three sine of T, and then T, okay? Now, um, you could go based on what, um, like just, oh, it looks like this, so it should look like that. But I don't necessarily always memorize that information, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph this thing. And we know that T is um, our parameter there, right? So we know that the X coordinate is found from finding this value. The Y coordinate is found from finding this coordinate. And then the T or the Z value is apparently just found by finding T. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a chart. And I'm going to go ahead and figure out what R of T is so that I can plot these. And they are directional vectors. So when I plug in zero into here, here, and here, the function you end up with is five, or I'm sorry, not five. What am I thinking? Three. Because cosine of zero is one times three is three, zero, zero. Sine of zero is zero times three is zero. And if T is zero, Z is zero. Now I'm gonna try some more values like these and then see what they look like when I graph them, okay? So I'm only going to pi, I'm not going the whole circle pi over two. I just wanna get an idea so I know which graph to select, right? We don't need to graph it by hand, okay? Um, the whole thing anyway. So let me go here and here. And then I do need to draw the axes going in the other direction and down. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I'm going to make this three, two, and one. So they're going by halves. One, two, three. Right? One, two, three. And that's negative three, okay? So, and we'll do this. And that's three. And that's a negative three. I'm just trying to give myself some space so that it doesn't look so crunched, okay? So I'm gonna first plot this vector. I'm going three out in the X, zero in the Y, and zero in Z. So it's really just a vector um, going from here to here. And so there's my point there, okay? But it is go vector going from here to here, okay? Um, but the point lies right there, okay? Now let's keep going with the next one. So when I plug in pi over four, let's see what that looks like. On clear, three um, cosine pi over four. Let me hit the double arrow. So it's about 2.1, then three sine of pi over four. Let me hit the double arrow again. It's about 2.1. And if I'm plugging in that for t, pi over four as a decimal is about 0.8. Okay. So I'm gonna now plot that. This is my second point. So this is where I start at time equal to zero. And then at time equal to about 0.8, we are 2.1 units out, 212.1 units out this way. So we're about right here where the X and Y intersect. And then about half and a little bit more of a unit going upward, okay? And so it is this point here. Now remember, it's a vector going from the origin to here, but it's lifted up. So I'm not on the xy plane anymore. I'm above the xy plane. So although I'm going to approach this point in this manner, right, in this direction, because I started here first, I'm going to that one, um, it's also lifting up off the plane, okay? So not only is it rotating in that direction, but it also lifted up a little bit, okay? So now we're gonna go ahead and do our next point. So again, I might need 
the wiggles. So three cosine of pi over two. The oh, it just gives me zero. Then three sine of pi over two is three. And then pi over two is a decimal for t is about 1.6, okay? So now I'm gonna go zero for x, one, two, three for y, but then I'm gonna go up half a unit, a whole unit, another half a unit, and just a little bit more. So there's where my point lies, but it's even higher than the other one. So I'm still going in this direction around the circle, right? but I'm lifting it even higher now off that X, Y plane, okay? And let's keep going. You can kind of see what's going on, but let's just keep keep working at it, okay? Um, three pi over four. So cosine of three pi over four, um, double arrow is about negative 0 0.7. And then, Oh, I'm sorry, that was cosine. I needed to do three times cosine, clear. Three cosine of three pi over four. That's about negative 2.1 actually. And then three sine of three pi over four is positive 2.1. And then three pi over four is a decimal is about 2.4. So I have X is negative 2.1. Y is positive 2.1. Those two intersect about right here. But then from there, I've got to go up two units, one, two, one unit, two units, and almost a half again. So that's where this one is, okay? So it's even higher than the previous one, but still going in this direction along this circular curve. Um, this motion where you go around in a circle, okay? But you're going up as you do that. So if you're going in a circle, you start here at the bottom where the tip of my pin is at. So this is the X, Y plane, and then it's going around, but it's also going up at the same time. That's called the helix. Okay, your DNA is shaped like a helix. Um, but let's keep going till we get our last, last point. So cosine three, cosine of pi is going to be negative three. Um, three sine of pi is going to be zero. And then pi by itself we know is 3.14. So about 3.1, right? So I'm going negative three in the X zero, or I'm sorry, negative three in the X, zero for Y, so I don't go forward or backward, um, but then I need to go up three units. So half, one unit, two units, three units, point one. So notice this one's even higher than the one before, but we're still going around in that circle, okay? Again, I'm trying to draw it as best as I can. Now imagine it's still doing this, but it's gonna keep going up higher and higher and higher. And so it might start looking like something like this, where it's just, it looks like it's getting closer and closer to this, but really it's just lifting up off the page. Um, and the radius is still within three units. So you're always at any point in time, three units out away from the um, center, okay? Which of those graphs pertains to that? That's the part we need to figure out, okay? I would look for one of these points um, that match yours. So notice that they have a point here under five. It could be that, but I don't think that ours are going downward, right? We didn't have a point in this quadrant that's going downward, and I wouldn't. Because as I'm going around, it's going up, 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 up. Even when it comes over here, it's going to be above the XY plane, not below the XY plane. So this arrow does not make sense for our graph that we've been graphing. Now that one does have an up arrow, so it could possibly that one be that one. And this one has an up arrow. This one has a down arrow. So ours was not going down. Ours was increasing in Z value. See how the Z values are going up? 
So our arrow should be going up. So we're essentially talking about either this graph or that graph, okay? Um, and so it's just a matter of which one is correct. And it looks like this one is the one because we did have a point that was supposed to land on three zero, right? Um, for Y, so zero for X, three for Y, but then it went up 1.6 units. And that's exactly this point right here where it's going out three, there's no X coordinate and then it goes upward, okay? Whereas over here, I don't know what the coordinate is back here that they're using to get this value here, okay? Um, I just don't know that ours would have landed right there or not. So I'm gonna actually select this one. And I'm, I haven't checked one in this section yet. I'm just gonna check this one and see if it's correct. But I think that should be the correct um, image there, okay? But definitely pay attention to your Z values. If they're going up, great. If they're going down, then look for the down arrows, okay? Um, for number seven, what does it want for number seven? For number seven, it wants us to um, represent the plane curve by a vector valued function. Now, these are a little funny because it's pretty standard. All you do is you say, let x equal t, then y will equal the exact same thing, but instead of x, you plug in t, right? So then you have t plus two, okay? And so then what does the vector function look like? It looks like t for the x coordinate or x component, and then t plus two for the y component, okay? So those are pretty simple. Um, especially number eight, same thing. You're gonna let x equal t. And then if x is t, y would be one minus t squared, right? So then your function would be t and then one minus t squared, okay? So those are a little, they're pretty easy, but you do need to know how to do that so that when we have to do that later, you're good, okay? Um, now, this one is a little bit different when you have um, a circle, okay? Because we know how to parametrize a circle. So number nine is a little bit different. You know that x squared plus y squared equals 49 is a circle. And you know that you can put that in its polar coordinates, right? Because it's th two dimensional, you can put it in a two dimensional polar coordinate which means that the X is R cosine theta, and then the Y is R sine theta. Like we already know that we can do that, okay? Um, actually, I don't even need to do that. I just need to say no vectors yet. And so R in this case is seven. So my X would be seven cosine of theta, and my Y would be um, seven sine of theta. So then the function would be um, this X component and then this Y component, okay? So that's all you would need for number nine. For number 10, oh, they're finally getting into limits. We'll start getting into some vector calculus in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna put this in vector form. So I get E for component form. Then I get sine of three T over three T and then E to the negative two T. So for these, you're basically taking the limit of each individual component. Now, depending on how much you remember, I can use direct substitution for these. So I can just go like that. This one, you cannot use direct substitution because you get zero over zero. And so when you try to do the direct substitution and you get um, an indeterminate form, zero over zero, you can use L'Hopital's rule. 
So L'Hopital's rule says that the limit of this is the same as the limit of the derivative ratio. So the derivative of sine is cosine and then due to the chain rule, because my argument, my angle is not just a, a T, I have to multiply by the derivative of this inside stuff. And then the derivative of three T is just three. So these threes end up canceling. This other one I can do by direct substitution. So I have E to the negative two times zero. So that gives me E to the zero. If I do direct substitution now, I get cosine of three times zero. And e to the zero is one, cosine of zero is one, and e to the zero is one. So the answer there is just one, one, one. <laughs> okay, and then number 11, make sure you watch that video so that you can select the correct answer there. But other than that, that is it for 12.1. And so I think this is the end of the videos for this week.